It is Saturday, December 31st, 2022. Good morning and welcome to the morning service of reflection at Cathedral Church of All Saints in Halifax. My name is Gordon and I'm a parishioner here at All Saints. For our reflection this morning, we go to the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verses 1 to 18. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there was in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool, in Aramaic called Matsava, which has five porticles. In these porticles lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him laying there, he knew that he had already been there a very long time. He said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred. And while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, get up, take your bed, and walk. At once the man was healed, and he took up his bed, and he walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is a Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me, that man, said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who was this man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went and told the Jews it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working now on the Sabbath, and so will I. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more than to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling himself son of God, or God was his father, making himself equal to God. There are two features which come to play when reflecting on any story or any passage in John's Gospel. The first is the question of authorship. For this gospel, the implications of authorship are different than the ones with the synoptic. To begin with, it is unlikely that the authors of Mark, Matthew, and Luke spoke with or knew Jesus personally. They were first century post-resurrection Christians. Their faith was derived from the experience of the risen Lord. But church traditions and largely current biblical scholarship, suggests that John's gospel originated with the beloved disciple, John. If so, authorship, in full or in part, can be traced back to, the, to a member of Jesus' inner circle. Like all gospel writers, John was writing for a post-resurrection church, but his initial experience of the risen Lord occurred at the empty tomb. John openly states that he is writing 
that we might believe. In other words, he's being deliberately and purposeful, deliberate and purposeful about the material he selects and how he presents it. It is in this is in the, in the section it is in the selection of material and the presentation of the material we encounter the second defining feature of John's gospel its depth and its complexity Today's reading is a good example of this depth and complexity as the narrative draws us into a layered story preparing us what Jesus is about to say. To begin with, John's, in John, miracles are not simple events. They are signs. Signs that lead us forward. In today's passage, the miracle story is infused with symbolism, which foreshadows its own conclusions. The story begins as Jesus approaches the healing pool where there are many invalids. To be healed, an invalid had to wait for the pool to be stirred and quickly make his way into the water. At the pool, there were five porticles or entrances. This could be passed over as simply a descriptive fact but many scholars suggest that the five porticles represent the five books of the Jewish law. Furthermore, it seems that John is using the man and his situation to symbolically represent the Jewish nation. In the context of the miracle story, the healing power of the law is not accessible to the invalid and by extension not accessible to the nation. More to the point, there is no one to help. But John says, when help does come, it is not in the form of being carried somewhere. It is immediately present in Jesus' own power to heal. The story also indicates that Jesus had foreknowledge of the man's plight. The man had been sitting there for a very long time. But then Jesus asks the man, do you wish to be healed? This is often mistaken as an inquiry into what the man wants or wanted. But Jesus already knew that. So this is not so much an inquiry as it is an invitation. The man's answer is both practical and theological. He has not been able to heal himself, and there is no one who can help him. Jesus tells the man, take up your bed and walk. Not only does Jesus know the man's needs, he has the power to respond, metaphorically, this applies to us as well. It is not difficult then to see how John's narrative is already begun to engulf us and pull us into meaning more than into fact. Next, the authorities catch the man carrying his bed on the Sabbath and they chastise him for it. But the man replies, the one who healed me told me to carry my bed. It was bad enough that the miracle had been performed on the Sabbath. But the one who had performed the miracle gave the man permission to break the Sabbath law. Who would have the audacity to authorize such an affront? The answer came from the healed man. It was Jesus, verse 15. The man knew this because in a second encounter in the temple, verse 14, Jesus said to him, See, you have been made well. Do not sin anymore. We should not forget that in those times, 
illness and infirmity were thought to be the result of sin. Jesus not only had the audacity to break the law and encourage the man to do the same, now by his actions and by his words, Jesus has acknowledged that through his power to heal, the man's sins had been removed. As important as breaking the Sabbath was, it pales in comparison to removing sin. The final stage of the narrative has now been set. Jesus, or the Jews, started to persecute Jesus. Not because he performed a miracle, and not simply because he did it on the Sabbath, and not because he gave the man permission to make up, take up his bed and walk on the Sabbath, but Jesus had linked his actions with something only God could do. The, the dialogue that follows drives at the very heart of this tension and pulls us into the epicenter of the storm. In his own defense, Jesus says, my father is still working on the Sabbath and I also am working. The Jews responded, there you have it. He is not only breaking the Sabbath, but he is also calling God his own father, thereby making himself equal to God. This is the concluding point of the miracle story. It is what the sign is really all about. The remainder of chapter 12 is a homily where Jesus explores the relationship between himself, the Son, and God, his Father. Our reflection opened with the issue of authorship, you remember. Authorship of this gospel weighs heavy on its message. Was it John, the disciple, who wrote seemingly from his own experience in chapter 20? Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you, have, you will have life in him. Let's pause for a second and think about signs and what they mean. Lord, forgive us for asking for signs so that we might believe. Signs are there. They are continually before us. So we do not ask for signs that we might believe. Instead, we ask for the faith by which to see them, for the guidance to discern them. And as we approach the new year, the courage to follow them.